Hello and welcome to the cellars of the National Wine Centre in Adelaide uh, for today's webcast, Road to China, Trade, Business and Culture. Uh, it's currently lunchtime here in Adelaide, uh, so the upstairs cafe is getting a little bit noisy, so should you hear anything that's a little bit um, unusual, we'll just plough plow on through and uh, keep going. I'm Sonia Logan, editor of the Wine and Viticulture Journal and your host for today's uh, webcast, um, which is brought to you by uh, the Australian Grape and Wine uh, authority in conjunction with Wine Communicators of Australia. This webcast and the partnered webinars the two organisations will hold throughout the coming year seek to support in the form of research extension AGWA's role in investing in research development and extension, growing domestic and international markets and protecting the reputation of Australian wine. For the next hour and a half, we will hear from our four presenters, Steve Guy, Aaron Brasher, Jing Cao and Andrew Bradbury, who I will introduce shortly, uh, who will each offer a unique perspective on what you need to know when taking the wine export road to China and discuss and attempt to answer and as many of your questions as they can about the new free trade agreement, what it means in managing expectations, China's economic realities, a few of the cultural and logistical things you should know about doing business in China, what the wine consumption and retail options look like in China, what the essential first steps are for entry into China's wine market. Uh, now, for those of you who have participated in WCA webinars in the past, the format for today is all going to seem pretty familiar. Uh, but for those of you who are new, welcome. Sit back and simply take in all the information that will be presented to you today. Or if you uh, prefer, uh, you are welcome to answer, ask some questions or make some comments, you, you can, via the information there on your screen. Just enter your comment or question in the box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and we'll aim to address them as we go along. We will also have time at the end to discuss more questions and when it's all over, uh, we'd love you to fill out the exit survey so we can get your feedback on uh, what you thought of today's event. WCA's Program Manager Jen Barrick will be monitoring your questions and you can also reach out to her via the Twitter handle at winecomost or with the hashtag WCAweb, or on email comms at winecommunicators.com.au. And of course, if you experience any difficulty, technical dif difficulties, you can contact uh, Redback support via the details on your screen. Now, each of our presenters have a chosen topic to discuss. We'll be pairing them up two by two. And as I've already said, they'll also try to answer any additional questions you may have as we go along. And at the end, we'll try and fit all four of them into this space uh, for a chat and more questions. So that's it for the housekeeping. So on to our first speaker. First up, Steve Guy. Welcome, Steve. Hello, Sonia. Steve has worked for several of Australia's largest wine companies. He took on his current role as compliant ma compliance manager with Agua, Agua, formerly the Australian Wine and Brandy Corporation, in September 2000. Steve's responsibilities encompass regulatory compliance as well as Agwa's contribution to market access initiatives. Steve's going to take us through some regulation matters. Now Steve, as many of us would know, Australia recently concluded a free trade agreement with China which has been described as having the potential to add tens of millions of dollars to the Australian wine industry's export earnings. Firstly, can you explain what an FTA actually is? Yeah, thanks uh, Sonia. It's probably slightly misleading to actually call this agreement free trade, uh, freer trade perhaps, but uh, in an ideal world it would be possible for an Australian wine producer to make wine in accordance with our law, which is in the Food Standards Code, mm -hmm. and then label that wine in accordance with the rules that apply in Australia, and then send that around the, the world to every market. That would be a wonderful situation, but in fact that's not the case and this free trade agreement really doesn't move as much closer to that uh, situation. What it does do is it lowers the tariffs uh, that apply to Australian wine entering the Chinese market. Okay, so what is the difference between a tariff and the other taxes that apply to wine? Uh, yeah, this often confuses people. A, a tariff is a tax, it's a particular tax, a particular type of tax, it's a tax that only applies to imported product. So for example, if we look at the Australian situation, we know there's various taxes that apply to wine, in particular you know, the wine equalisation tax, mm -hmm. wet, and the GST. Mm -hmm. But Australia also applies a tariff to imported 
product. It's only small. It's only 5%. And Australian wine doesn't, is not affected by that tariff, but imported product is. Um, the United States concluded a free trade agreement with Australia well, 12, 13 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And so United States wine, so Oregon Pinot Noir, for example, doesn't face that tariff on entering Australia, but it still faces the wet and the GST. French wine, Champagne, for example, there's no free trade agreement with Australia, so French wine faces that 5% tariff. And of course, it's exactly the same going the other way. So when Australian wine goes to China, once the free trade agreement is fully implemented, will no longer face the 14% tariff, but other Chinese taxes, the value-added tax, the consumption tax, etc., will mm -hmm. still apply. Okay, all right. Now, Australian wine exporters have faced various technical problems when shipping wine to China, manganese and sugar levels just being a couple. Are these going to be solved by the FTA? Uh, Unfortunately, not. Um, it would be, again, it would be wonderful if that was the case, uh, but uh, Australian exporters do need to be very careful uh, when sending wine to the Chinese market. Uh, I might take you a few, um, through a few of the, um, the technical problems that um, exporters have faced in recent times. Uh, but before I do, um, Obviously, we don't have a lot of time today to go into great detail, so I'd just like to draw everyone's attention to the export market guides that mm -hmm. AGWA uh, publishes for a range of markets, not only China, uh, but these guides cover the uh, sort of material you can see uh, on your screen now, um, mostly technical issues, mm -hmm. labelling requirements, import procedures, wine composition. And these, this, very importantly, these guides are freely available, uh, I'm sure, to most of the people uh, who are taking part in this webcast because if you're a levy payer, or even if you're not a levy payer, if you hold an export licence, then you have free access to this material. Uh, so, Sonia, you mentioned uh, manganese, mm. and that's probably the issue that has attracted most publicity in, in, in recent times, but uh, in fact, it's, it's not manganese that's caused the most problems. Um, what you can see on the screen now is a stylized version of what a uh, Chinese wine label uh, should look like. Mm -hmm. Each of those items you can see on that uh, example there are mandatory uh, to be included on wine for the Chinese market. And I'd just like to draw your attention in particular to item number uh, five, the product type, uh, because it's essential in China, unlike most markets, it's essential to include an indication of the sweetness level of the wine. So whether it's dry, whether it's semi-dry, whether it's sweet, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. And um, perhaps unfortunately, um, those categories, dry, semi-dry, sweet, etc., are uh, defined, and you can see on this slide now uh, what the rules are uh, for each of those product types. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the reason that uh, so many Australian wine producers, and I should say not only Australian producers, but pr international uh, wine from around the world has run into trouble in the Chinese market is that the typical way we measure sugar in mm. Australia is to look at the level of glucose and mm. fructose in the wine. Mm. The Chinese use a different method and it invariably gives a higher result. So you may think that uh, your wine is dry based on the Australian method, label accordingly the wine goes to China, measured using a different method, a method that indicates the wine is in fact not dry, and immediately you're at risk of losing that consignment, the wine being uh, uh, refused entry to the market and perhaps even being returned to Australia. So uh, that is something that is really critical, that when you're designing your labels for the Chinese market, 
uh, you ensure that the indication of sweetness is uh, based on the Chinese test method. Related uh, to that is the issue that uh, I'm sure most Australian wine producers wouldn't be familiar with. Uh, this is something called sugar-free extract. It's a uh, rather ancient um, measurement. Right. Uh, the it's in idiosyncratic use in, in, uh, within China. And here, if your wine doesn't meet a minimum for this particular measurement, then it is also in danger of being rejected. So uh, this is a particular problem with light wines, low alcohol wines such as Moscato's, and we're aware of uh, a couple of Australian producers who've had uh, their wines rejected for not meeting this minimum. So look, I'm not gonna go through a, uh, a, a list of all the problems of Australian, that Australian winemakers have encountered in that market recently, but I think I could probably sum it all up by saying that uh, uh, the environment, the, the regulatory environment in China is unpredictable. We really don't know where the next problem is going to come from. Manganese surfaced out of nowhere, uh, so did sugar-free extract, and uh, really who knows what the next problem is going to be. Right. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to... Um, thank you, Steve. Um, I'd now like to bring Aaron Brasher, uh, Regional Director, Asia-Pacific, with the Australian Grape and Wine Authority, in on the discussion. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, to both of you, regarding the FTA, what expectations should the industry have for its effect? Well, look, I think the first thing people need to understand is that um, despite some of the recent publicity, you know, this agreement is still to be signed. Uh, uh, just before Christmas, uh, there was uh, an announcement um, which I think it led a lot of people to believe that, uh, you know, the, the agreement had been finalised and certainly the negotiations have been, uh, but we still have not uh, had advice that the signature has proceeded. Uh, it's imminent, it's probably not too far away, but even when it does occur, there's still quite a lengthy process that needs to be um, gone through. So the, the, the agreement will need to go through Parliament, it then goes to a, a parliamentary committee, and you know it could well be later this year, in fact perhaps could even be quite late this year, before this agreement is in force. Okay. Uh, look, yeah, I think um, time will tell. Um, and uh, we, we talk about the FTA and, and, and its ramifications and uh, again it's, it, it's going to create that level playing field. Um, you know, Chile have got one uh, which again we, you know, they're a major competitor, they're selling more volume into uh, China th than us but uh, not at the same price points. We've got a higher value, much higher value uh, product going in. So I think uh, as, what it will do is create that even playing field and create positive noise around Australia as a category. Okay. And I think the other thing we need to mention there is that even when this agreement comes into force, hopefully sometime later this year, the tariff which is 14%, won't reduce to zero immediately. It'll, it'll be uh, in stages over a four year period. Okay, right. And I think the, the reality is it's, it's, it's not the silver bullet or the panacea to, mm -hmm. to uh, give this, the Australian industry this massive surge. Mm -hmm. um, we still have to put our, our best foot forward, keep presenting premium Australian wine, mm -hmm. telling the stories, spending time on the ground uh, and making sure that uh, we've got a longer term view for the China market, not a, not a short mercenary view on it. Uh, now to a question from one of my readers. Um, what will be the impact on retail pricing for Australian wines already in the market once the FTA does come into force? So, yeah, so I suppose to Steve's point, once this FTA is implemented, uh, I can't see retailers or restaurants dropping their price uh, to reflect the, the saving on the tariff. It, I, I, it may, it, some may. What I do see is that the importers and distributors will uh, capture more margin. What that will do is uh, give them more of an incentive to embrace the Australian wine category and therefore hopefully uh, we see a, a further influx of Australian, Australian wine into the marketplace because of those higher margins that are being captured through the, through the chain. Okay. All right, well thank you Steve yep. um, for your input today um, and if anyone has any questions for Steve he'll be available uh, during the Q&A session uh, at the end of the webcast. We've got a question coming in, do we? 
Do we know what other exporting countries such as France, Spain, Italy, Chile have a free trade agreement or are about to secure a free trade agreement with China? That might have been one for Steve, perhaps. We might hold that one off to we the end and come back to that. We might hold that one for Steve later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Aaron, you're going to take us through what the Chinese market looks like today. But before you do, just a reminder that uh, there will be an opportunity for, you, for Aaron to answer your questions uh, at the end of his session. So, Aaron, what does the Chinese market, Chinese consumer think of Australian wine? Yeah, well, look, before we, uh, before we head down that path into some, a bit of a consumer analysis, let's, let's have a look at the China market mm-hmm. because uh, you know, over the last decade it has gone from uh, you know, relative obscurity to be uh, a, a stellar market for Australian wine. Um, there's a slide here which uh, has a fair bit of detail. You can see that in the last five years, volume actually hasn't uh, changed too much. Mm-hmm. It, it's, mm-hmm. it's been a- absolutely flat. We've had some peaks uh, back in 2010. Austerity measures have impacted over the last couple of years. Um, there's talk of austerity measures impacting that wine category, not just for Australia, but the whole category for the next few years. Um, where we have seen growth, though, at the end of December, was Australia is back into positive mm-hmm. uh, 8% growth as far as, as volume. Mm-hmm. It's a $224 million market for Australian wine. So it's mm-hmm. our third largest mm-hmm. market by, by value and our fourth by volume. So it's a lucrative market. I think also telling to me is the those dollars per litre that uh, Australia is getting for its bottled exports there. It's uh, $6.83, uh, which um, is high in the context of, uh, of global comp- competition. France is at $4.91 a litre, and you've got uh, the likes of Spain bringing up the bottom at $2.74, and that's the top 10 export countries into China. So to me, that's a, that's a good, strong, positive, premium fine wine message that is being propagated in China. Um, so that five-year compound growth rate of, in value has been around about been around about 11%. So again, some some pretty steady growth there. And as I said, back into positive growth uh, in this last uh, in this last quarter. Uh, I, I talked about um, the values per litre, and I think that sort of reflects in that we're fourth in uh, in volume total, but number two in, in value. So France is by far and away the largest in value and volume. Um, they're three times larger in, in their value than the Australian category into China. But again, I, I, I'll go back to that point that our, our dollars per litre are significantly higher than France. So there's some good news there. And again, I think um, protecting our price point is pretty important uh, for the future of Australian wine in the Chinese marketplace. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Again, just to give you some perspective, it's a, uh, if you look at that second uh, bar graph in, it's a massive area of... Uh, of light blue, which denotes that it's non-wine drinkers. Now, the population of China is 1.3 billion. Uh, there's a significant uh, population slice there that don't consume wine. There's the, the, the talk, the chatter around the ever-increasing middle class that have a propensity to now you know, uh, embrace a bit more Western style of food or Western uh, style of wine. They're travelling more. Interestingly, uh, Tourism Australia, uh, some data from them, the largest influx of tourists coming into the country now is Chinese. That's going to hit 800,000. Oh, it has just hit 800,000, actually. So, again, it's how do we send the Chinese tourists away with strong, positive messages about Australian wine to then take it back to be adopters in, into their country. Okay. So, again, that, uh, that graph just shows that uh, you know, there's a lo- large proportion of non-Australian wine drinkers, non-wine drinkers, um, and the opportunity is there. Now, how much we can grow that uh, is anyone's guess at this point in time. This one, uh, interestingly, uh, wine is the fastest growing alcoholic beverage in China. Beer is significant as it is spirits. Wine only accounts for 10% of the total volume, but at 25% of the value. So again, uh, positive messages around uh, this is a premium product, people are prepared to pay, and, and there's, there's growth in it. What we have got, though, is some consumer data that's come back saying that um, uh, Australia is lagging behind France and, uh, and domestic wine as far as consumption and uh, uh, again there's some, some room for improvement there and again I think the uh, platforms that we're putting in place, Agua as well as uh, the, uh, what the producers are putting in place are encouraging mm-hmm. that, uh, that consumption and that reconsumption of Australian wine. Uh, again, some pretty extensive consumer analysis done by Wine Intelligence uh, and also by the, uh, the China Benchmark Program from the uh, UniSA in that um, a significant uh, cross-section of, of wine consumers were, were uh, consulted. Mm-hmm. 
And um, it's interesting, the, the view of Australian wine is, is it's both value and fine, and it's this conundrum whether they can coexist. And uh, we think that uh, as a provider of value and fine that we, we can exist. Um, where we saw some, uh, some misses around Australian wine as a category was that it's not viewed as expensive. France has the mantle well and truly as, of the, the top end of town. Um, and it's interesting when you, you see how much uh, the propensity for, for top end Bordeaux, but yet their dollars per litre is significantly less than Australia. Mm -hmm. France at that, that top end uh, really does very well in imaging the whole French category. Um, and also one of the things that we, we saw was that uh, Australian wine is not for gift giving occasions. So again, I think um, we have a strong platform there around premium messages. How do we further enhance that to not only be viewed as value and fine wine, but also how do we ramp it up to be the, uh, the gift or the, it has the prestige and the kudos as well. So again, there's, there's some challenges for, mm -hmm. for, for us, also challenges for industry. And out of the China wine barometer, the, the, those findings, um, you know, there's been a, n a number of three papers produced some uh, fairly extensive research done. Um, and the finding was that there are no strong associations for Australia. So, you know, this should serve as a call to action for Wine Australia, AGWA, as well as industry to uh, address those, those misses. Uh, um, out of this research, it was found that Barossa Valley actually resonates the strongest as far as any region in Australia. And the Barossa are on the front foot and introducing um, education platforms into, uh, into China, along with our uh, Wine Australia's platforms, uh, complementing that. So it's how do we invest in the message there? How do we uh, get the message about regions out there further? But I think also get back to that 800,000 uh, Chinese that are coming into Australia and how do we send them away with positive sound bites around the Australian wine industry to give them the cues when they get back into the marketplace to be able to purchase, purchase Australian wine. Um, so I think the, the, it, the actions here are really for industry and for, uh, for producers to uh, put in place some, some activities to heighten your offering. Um, again, I think uh, we need that long-term strategy. We need that long-term focus. We don't want to be mercenary and, and, and uh, sort of breeze in and breeze out of the marketplace. It needs to be planned and, and, and we need to leverage those opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so Wine Australia, as far as what we're doing in the marketplace, um, and again, um, we've, we've active there, we've got a team based out of Shanghai of five. Uh, we're we're a tr across, across trade, consumer and education platforms. Um, trade events, you know, there's any number of wine shows, uh, wine events held in China. There seems to be a new one every week and new ones popping up all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we disseminate what are the important ones? Again, we put out a prospectus of activities. Uh, you know, we get involved in the Chengdu Wine Fair, which is one of the oldest and uh, most uh, well attended wine fairs. Uh, we've had uh, activities out there around uh, uh, Provine and Sial. Again, it's if the industry are prepared to back and sign up to our activities, then we go in uh, en masse. It's, and it's about engaging the trade, it's about engaging influencers, media, and also getting consumers engaged as well. Um, Wine Australia, we have our, our annual road shows, and that's generally through uh, second and third tier cities. What the findings were out of the, uh, the China Wine Barometer uh, research was that uh, actually tier two cities have very strong uh, messages about Australia, strong resonance, strong positive uh, sentiment around Australia as a wine producing country. So this year, the likes of uh, Dalian, Xi'an, Nanjing and Guangzhou are being visited as far as the, uh, this, uh, this road show. And it's, again, about engaging uh, the trade, the media, the influence, there's master classes and there's also a consumer element to these as well. And then uh, uh, we have, uh, as far as consumer, again, ultimately we want the consumer to go in and pick up a bottle of wine off that shelf or off that uh, wine list. And we, uh, we've partnered with uh, Yes My Wine, the, the online um, uh, wine provider before. You know, we've partnered with City, City Shop in, uh, in Shanghai and Beijing around uh, Australian wine and produce promotions. There's promotions that we work very closely with around Austrade, with uh, around meat and livestock, Tourism Australia. Um, and education is really important as well. We have uh, 20, around 20 wine educators across China who uh, have implemented the uh, Wine Australia wine course at level one. Recently we've gone in at level two. We've put through around about four and a half thousand consumers and trade uh, in, into this course. So again, it's all about propagating these messages, sending people away with the right, uh, the right cues around Australian wine. And there's things like 
Um, Rob Hurst, who's uh, hopefully on this uh, on this uh, hookup at the moment, the uh, the silver fox. Uh, he, he's uh, he's in, help, helping to uh, introduce the, the wine list of the year awards into China. I think it's now going into its third year. Again, it's recognition of Australian wine on wine lists. And uh, it's just keeping Australia front and square and making sure that we're sending the right messages the whole time. Yep, and then finally, uh, that's a lot of inbound stuff there into China. Uh, we, we actually get an annual group of, of around vintage time into Australia. Um, they're people from, that have been selected from Wine Australia Awards. They're significant contributors to the industry. They might be importers, distributors, media. Um, again, people that you want to get here, get them to walk the dirt, hear the stories, meet the people, taste the wines, and then get back to China and be fantastic ambassadors for Australian wines. So again, we've got a group of 20 here uh, in a month and a bit's time, and it's a really strong group of people that are visiting the country. All right, well, thank you, Erin. Now, I think we've got a few questions that have come in for, oops. Sorry, it's disappeared from my screen. <laughs> the joys of live broadcast. You can just make them up. <laughs> Could just make them up, but that wouldn't be fair. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Jen. What are other countries doing? Is there anything we can learn from about how they're growing their wine markets? Look, I think um, you know, countries like France, I mean, CEPEX are a, an incredibly strong and financial uh, body. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, out there with incredible presence, whether it's at trade events or in the marketplace. Uh, we see California making more and more of an impact into uh, into markets globally and again you know they've got a very strong proposition around not only wine but food and tourism and it, it's i suppose that's where australia we're trying to uh, get that messaging across as well working very closely with tourism australia around their restaurant australia uh, you know it's it's wine it's food it's the whole package um i, I think every, every you know the the slice of the the pie out there is is it's congested everyone's competing for for this marketplace and you know, uh, at Agua, we don't have necessarily the enormous uh, funds that uh, some of these EU countries have in in uh, their marketing activities. So I think it's being smart about what we do. It's about educating. It's about getting the right influence, talking about Australian wine. Um, it's advocating that the old shoe leather mentality, getting uh, rallying the troops and getting uh, Australian winemakers on the ground, telling their stories, showing their wines. Um, it's about having a long-term focus and a long-term strategy for the marketplace. Okay. Uh, now we also have a question from Nathan Gogol here um, which talks about the austerity measures which we will come to a little bit later so we might just uh, leave that one until then. Um, all right well thank you Aaron. My pleasure. Thank you for your time. We'll um, see you a little bit later. Indeed we'll catch you later at the end. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to introduce Jing Cao. Um, welcome Jing. Thank you Sonia. Uh, who is the Director of Chinese Language and Cultural Advice, based here in Adelaide. Uh, over the years, Jing has worked closely with the many well-known wine companies, the likes of Orlando Treasury and Accolade. Uh, he has also helped many small family wineries understand how to develop effective marketing materials and negotiate with their Chinese partners. Again, there'll be an opportunity for Jing to answer your questions at the end of this talk. Uh, so Jing, uh, yes. what what does the Chinese consumer look for in a brand of wine and, and what are the most important marketing tips for brands in, in China? Yes, well Sonia, I think China is a market that just keeps constantly changing, evolving and the Chinese consumers are very demanding. Um, they rely heavily on the internet for information. Mm -hmm. um, they have very little brand loyalty at this stage, which makes it very difficult to uh, promote a product to China. Um, I think in 2015, um, I think the Chinese consumers are no longer looking for just a foreign brand. And at the same time, they're not really looking for a domestic brand either. Mm -hmm. I think in this year, the Chinese consumers are really looking for global brands. Okay, not foreign brands, but global brands. Mm -hmm. And there's a fundamental difference in how these two things uh, work. Um, okay. now for example, um, let's take an example of food, all right? A hamburger, all right? We all love a good hamburger, don't we? Now, have you ever heard of a concept called 80% burger. I can't say I have, no. <laughs> okay, I think most of the Australians haven't really heard of that concept. 
So 80% burger is um, a marketing campaign um, done by KFC. Okay, KFC last year launched this 80% burger in China. It was a huge success. And the reason for that is that in Chinese culture, people always say that a healthy way of eating is that you eat up to 80%. Okay. So you never leave a restaurant feeling full. Okay. So you always eat up to 80% and leave the 20% of your stomach empty. So 80% eating is a healthy, sustainable way of, uh, of eating. So when the Chinese consumer goes to a KFC restaurant, uh, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure thing, but at the same time, they can buy this 80% burger uh, because they feel a bit healthy. Now, the 80% burger is basically a hamburger, but a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller than the average size. And that's what is really popular in China last year. So consumers want something that is global, a, a global brand, mm -hmm. but at the same time, something a little bit extra to offer to the Chinese consumers. And uh, what's really interesting now is that 20 years ago, if you look at 20 years ago, most companies can just sell a product to China and all they have to say is this product comes from Australia or this product comes from America and it will just sell. Right. But this day and age, when the market is getting more competitive, cons consumers are getting more educated, mm -hmm. you do need to do a bit, little bit extra to sell the product. And in wineries, uh, wineries for example, if your wines are already exporting to countries like uh, North America, the UK, other countries, it's really important that you send this message to your Chinese consumers because what that does is to help you build your global presence. Okay? Mm -hmm. Chinese consumers want, ultimately, what they want is the same experience as an Australian consumers can have or, or what uh, uh, American consumers can have. Mm -hmm. So if you tell them, look, this product is already successful, in, in North America, in Britain, in other markets, the Chinese people really genuinely believe that. Whereas if you only say to the Chinese consumers that this brand is created specifically for the Chinese, sometimes people get a bit upset about that because there's no global presence there. So you need to think globally. And when it comes to uh, branding, um, what do the Chinese consumers look for in a brand? And you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the reality is that most Chinese consumers don't care about Australian brands. Okay, they don't care about the brand, they don't care about the product. What they care about is what this product can make them look. Okay. It's the external factor. Okay, uh, I'll give you an example of that. Tourism Australia last year did a research on Chinese market, and uh, there's some really interesting um, findings there. For example, uh, um, Chinese consumers. Uh, have very little expectation of Australian wine and food. And in fact, um, what they found is that um, those people, those Chinese people who haven't been to Australia, um, they don't have really any expectation of Australian food or wine. Okay. And in fact, Australia was behind countries like Mexico or Brazil in terms of wine expectation. And, but at the same time, for those travelers who have been to Australia, um, they think very high of Australian wine and food. And in fact, uh, Australia came into the number one spot uh, ahead of countries like France. So there's a little bit of a gap there. Okay. And the other interesting thing about that research is what they found is, okay, they asked the question to the Chinese uh, people. They, they ask, what sort of images come to your mind? And what do you think of Australian food and wine? What sort of things do you think about? And uh, the number one answer that most Chinese people will say is that the food, the produce come from very clean, pristine environments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're all very fresh, especially the seafood. Mm -hmm. And what comes in as number three, this is really interesting. They say fish and chips on the beach, right. which is a little bit bizarre because I dare you, if you go to a fish and chips shop tonight, you look around the shop, you won't see any Chinese people there. Okay, fish and chips is not part of our diet. But what's really interesting here is that Chinese people, when they think about food, they don't really necessarily think about food or wine, but often they relate it to the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's not the fish and chips, but it's the fact you can enjoy on the beach, mm -hmm. that's what sells fish and chips. So wineries, I mean, based on that research, they found wineries with food, um, that only came in as number six in terms of you know, uh, people's exception, uh, expectation of, uh, of Australian wine and dine experience. So there's a little bit of, uh, you know, education that we need to we need to do in, in the China market and I'll give another example here um, the cosmetics industry mm -hmm. 
Now, here's a guy talking about cosmetics industry, which is, there's something wrong here. But I believe the cosmetics industry is something that one industry can actually learn a few things from, okay? Um, the cosmetics industry in China is very, very developed. It's a very matured market. It's very sophisticated. Consumers are highly educated. If you look at the industry in China now, the uh, cosmetic industry, 20% um, of the market is controlled by the domestic companies, whereas the 80% is controlled by foreign companies or joint ventures. And when a Chinese consumer goes into a shop to buy cosmetic goods, what they look for are, in my opinion, three things. The country of origin, mm -hmm. where it comes from. Um, the story of the brand. Mm -hmm. Have you got something interesting to tell the consumers? And the third thing is the price. Okay, the price. And I believe that the wine industry will probably go down a similar path in the next decade because, um, as many of you already know, um, that the wine market is becoming more normalized in China now, that people are not just buying wine as gifts, they're now actually buying wine for themselves, which means that they're actually paying out of their own pocket, which means the price has becoming, is becoming more important than ever before. So you've got to th actually think about the price. Uh, you've got to have to think about the brand story because everyone loves a good story, all right? So if, if your brand has a story to tell, to share with people, you know, family legacy, uh, heritage, history, um, you really need to get that message out there because the Chinese people really believe these real stories. And also the country of origin, what are you trying to promote? Is, just, is it just a product or are you also promoting Australia as in where the product is coming from? Yes. All right. Well, do we have any questions for Jing at this point in time? Question from Greg. If you were creating a wine brand for the Chinese market, what, what would your brand look like? Okay. Um, there's no quick answer. I think there's always a good balance. Um, you want it to look foreign, mm -hmm. but not something out of Chinese comfort zone. Mm -hmm. All right. So Chinese, group, Chinese people are very interesting. They want something different, but they want to keep it within their comfort space. Um, so um, just to give an example, like last year, uh, over 100 million Chinese travel overseas, but 90% of them travel within Asia. So there's a bit of a language barrier there. So when you're creating a brand, first of all, the brand name needs to be something is, that is translatable. That is something that Chinese people can pronounce. The image has to be um, different, but you've got to stay away from the cliche, like boxing kangaroos, uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. I'll probably try to stay away from those things because okay. that looks more like a tourism souvenir rather than a, mm -hmm. a, a brand image. So you've got to actually think about uh, being foreign, but at the same time, keep it within the comfort space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to introduce um, Andrew Buttery into the conversation now, if I can. Uh, Managing Director of Gemtree Wines in McLaren Vale. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. To you both, what is the economic reality of selling wine in China currently? Well, China is, uh, I suppose you've got the dichotomy of the, the very poor and the very rich. And um, a large, I suppose the average wage in China is somewhere between twelve and $15,000 a year. So, you know, it's about a quarter of our average salary here in Australia. So wine is, out, particularly our wine, is out of the reach of a lot of consumers. Um, in China um, and then um, that's coupled with what's happened in the last uh, 12 to 18 months where the, uh, the central government has tightened monetary policy um, and that's had a flow on effect into the real estate sector and I've seen it firsthand. I was there last year uh, living uh, in Chengdu and, I, and I, um, I saw how tough it was for people in the real estate sector. So um, that's definitely having a flow on effect uh, through the economy. But at the same token, um, you know, you've got very wealthy people and the rise of the upper middle class there. So uh, they can afford wine and, uh, you know, they're prepared to pay a little bit more for wine. So, um, you know, the, it's, look, it's still a growing economy and um, unemployment's not a big issue there uh, from what I can see. You know, if, if, if people are talented and have got some sort of skills, skill set, then they can get a job and they can earn a reasonable wage. Okay. Do you want to add anything? Well, um, I want to talk about politics for a second. I know we all hate politics, mm. but um, in China, there's something called the five-year plan. Yeah. So every five years, the central government will outline the priorities for the nation. So that includes the social reform, economic reform, 
And the current plan, which is the 12th version, so the 12th five-year plan, um, that runs from 2011 to 2015, which means this year there will be a new plan for the next five years. And based on my knowledge that the, the next five-year plan, um, the highlight is really about transforming China's economy from, a, uh, uh, from an investment-driven economy into a domestic consumption economy. So in other words, the government is now drawing up policies to encourage people to spend money, which is a good news. But before people can confidently spend their money, there's a lot of problems the government needs to fix, including you know, the, the aged care, uh, the pension fund, um, the, the healthcare system, education. There's a lot of issues that gov government needs to fix before they can tell people, look, you can now spend your money because we've taken care of everything for you. So if you're looking ahead the next five years, the government is trying very hard to encourage people to spend money, buy products. So in the long run, I think that's a, it, it, it's looking very positive. Okay. So yes. you think people are going to have the disposable income to, to spend Absolutely, on Absolutely, yes. On now, well, last year, the disposable income rose by 10% uh, in China, which is a very good growth. I mean, if you take away the CPI, you're looking at about real life, about 8% growth. I mean, it's not as big as what we saw 10 years ago, but it's still steady growth. So we're still seeing things happening in China. Okay. Yeah. There's still a, a, a lot of people below the poverty line, aren't they? So um, yes, there's yes. only probably so, so much of the market that we're going to be able to, to access at this point in time. Anyway. That's right, yes. And at the same time, the government is pushing millions of people to, into the cities, as, the, you know, as we call it, the urban migration. I mean, each year, at least 10 million, city, uh, 10 million peoples are moving into cities. And these people will be demanding better quality of life, better food, better education. And at a certain point, they'll be asking for you know, global brands, mm -hmm. and one is part of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, we've probably got a t opportunity to answer a couple of questions in here. Um, are there any particular aspects of label design, this is from Josh Sawyer, uh, that you might suggest as being too foreign or outside of Chinese consumers' comfort zones? Um, aside from critter cliches, is there anything else we could suggest working with there? Well, there's always two sides to the story, isn't it? Because as I say, on one hand, you've got to get the, the message right, but on the other hand, there's a lot more to it other than just the, what the label looks like. Um, but what I would always suggest people to, to think about is the story, mm -hmm. okay? A story, not so much as in like what kind of particular word you should go for, like uh, um, some fancy words, but how do you actually tell a story in a very plain, um, direct way that actually can create an emotional response, not just to the Chinese, but to the Australians as well. So the ability to tell a story um, is more important than some of the fancy words you choose. Okay. And uh, Andrew, would you like to add something? Well, I think most Chinese take, have taken their cues from French wine labels, very conservative labels. And I think if you push the boundaries too hard, you're likely to potentially alienate the consumer. They'll, they'll rather go for a safer choice, something a little bit more conservative. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can be creative, but I wouldn't go over the top. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question we have from Gemma. Uh, Hi, Jing. I've heard that consumers in China have difficulty accessing Google and other search engines due to government restrictions on the internet. Assuming this is correct, uh, what limitations do you see for Australia because of this? And what recommendations do you have? Thank you. Okay, good question. Um, Google is you know, not accessible in China, um, so there's most of the social media sites. But the reality is that Google is, has never been a big player in China. I mean, the most, of, um, the most of the market is controlled by a search engine called Baidu, which is more than 80% of the market. So um, there are always alternatives in China um, you, can, you can go for, but you just have to really understand what's allowed. For example, a lot of wineries have uh, videos on their websites, you know, YouTube videos, which is basically banned most of the time in China, but there are always alternatives in China. Mm -hmm. There's always a similar uh, search engine or a similar video sharing platform you can go for in China. But what I do want to tell people is that once you upload something, it's, it's there. So you've got to really think carefully about what you actually put on there, mm -hmm. all right? And I've seen in, over the years that uh, you know, uh, companies who uh, have some of the uh, marketing materials translated and put on their websites or their videos, uh, but they don't really have somebody to go through the translation, okay. which sometimes causes a little, little bit of a problem because sometimes the brand name can be translated in different ways, even on the same video. So whatever you decide to do, um, just always make sure that there's somebody who can actually check that piece of work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, oh, I've just got another question come in here. 
from Sarah Andrew. Does wine style matter? Does red compared to white or dry compared to sweet when the majority of consumers are focused on global brand, as you mentioned, rather than what is in the bottle? Yeah. Andrew, well, from your experience? Okay. Um, well, for a start, um, a lot of people don't understand the difference between Shiraz and Cabernet and Cabernet and Merlot. So, um, but, and wine style is going to vary, uh, you know, from one province to another. Um, particularly around t st you know, types of cuisine, you know, Sichuan provinces, there's a lot of chili and Guangzhou. Um, I think the, you know, the, it's, a, it's milder and, there's, and, and a broader range of cuisine there. Um, look, I think, I think it comes back to the, the country of origin and what you're recognised for, you know, I mean, France is recognised more more around Bordeaux and blends. Australia's recognised more, you know, for Shiraz. So, so we tend to lead with Shiraz out of Australia, and and that's what we're becoming recognised for. And then over time, you start to introduce other wine styles to your, uh, you know, to your customer base. Um, so, yeah, I I don't think a lot of consumers are discerning enough at this point in time, um, and it, and it's going to be something that will evolve. Okay. Uh, another question for Jing. You talked about creation of the brand. Uh, what about protecting an Australian brand in China? Can you talk on that? Well, I think that the, the, the advice, you know, not being a, a lawyer, is that you always need to take matters into your own hands and don't simply trust someone in China to do it for you because mm. you never know what they're actually doing. Mm. So, for example, if you're registering your business in China, you, I, I assume you would have a proper Chinese name mm. for your brand. You always need to do that yourself. I mean, my advice is always try to do that yourself or at least get your own lawyers to actually look after that for you rather than saying to someone in China, please register my brand. And not only registering that brand, but also same time, think of all the other keywords. For example, if your brand name is X and X, um, what about uh, South Australian X and X? All of those other keywords that may people people might be searching for on the internet, but I always would say that you need to do it yourself rather than simply trusting somebody six thousand kilometers away to do it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Jing. If you. we've got an opportunity for people to ask more questions of Jing, Jing later on in the Q and A session, I'd like to bring in Andrew a bit closer to me now. Um, uh, Andrew started doing business in China in 2008 and over the past six years has developed an extensive network of contacts and a sound understanding of Chinese business culture and the challenges of marketing wine in this developing market. Uh, he is also a national board member for the Australian China Business Council and is passionate about developing a long-term footprint for Australian wine in China. Uh, again, there'll be an opportunity to answer questions of Andrew at the end of the webcast. I'll give that one to you, Thank Andrew. You. Now, to doing business in China, uh, what do you recommend as the first five steps to take? Uh, okay, so I'll just preface this by saying this is my own personal experience. So, um, you know, I'm not, uh, it's not exactly the right answers, but it's, it's from my experience over the last few years. Um, the first thing uh, for me is asking myself or ask yourself the question whether you're ready to commit to selling in China. And, um, you know, China is not the UK, it's not the USA, it's not those familiar markets where we can talk the same language. And uh, you know, for that reason, you really do have to, have to ask yourself that question. Um, uh, if you're going to enter China, if you want to enter China, you have to commit to travel. And fortunately, it is a bit closer than uh, you know some of those other um, countries I just mentioned. And uh, and time and and, it, and we're in the same time zone, which certainly helps from a jet lag point of view. Mm. Um, and uh, you need to be prepared to put the time and effort in to prepare for China. Um, so um, you do have to do more, more work around um, understanding the market, um, uh, getting translators organised, um, and um, yeah, it's just it's it's not the US or, or the UK. So just you, you need to put more time and effort in. Um, you really need to think about um, whether you have the patience for China. Um, and a lot of that is around language and, and culture and um, the fact that you can't pick up a phone and, and talk to your customer. Um, and, uh, you know, that most of your conversations are likely to be through a third party. So you'll be working through a translator to ask questions and then the translator will be translating questions back to you or responses back to you. So everything does take um, a, a little bit longer. and um, and 
whatever you do, don't get carried away by the, the fact that there's 1.3 billion people in China and it's a big market because um, the wine drinking market um, is certainly not 1.3 billion people. So um, there are no easy wins um, and it will take time. Um, uh, I'd certainly recommend that um, uh, you have someone on the ground here in Australia to assist you with communication um, and, and certainly when you go to China that um, you engage someone to, uh, uh, to come along with you to the meetings that you attend. Um, the other thing from a small wine company's point of view or small to medium size is um, the demand in a lot of the uh, tier two to tier four cities is around cheaper products and um, so uh, that might be uh, you, you may have to consider because of the life cycle of the market and where it's at and, and a lot of customers are asking for entry level products um, whether you're prepared to play that game or not and, uh, and go out and source uh, you know, those products and develop those products um, for those customers. Um, my second step uh, is really knowing your customer and you could say this for, for any market you're going into but um, you know, specifically for China, um, I certainly wouldn't um, want to do business with someone unless I'd met them face to face. Um, uh, you know, you get obviously we all get uh, um, inquiries on email, and um, you know they can get to a certain point. But I think once you get to a point, you really should uh, meet that customer. Um, and and part of that is get, is understanding their business, um, who they are, have they been in the wine business. Uh, for a long time or are they a new entrant um, into the wine business and there are many new entrants into the wine business um, you know people who have been in other businesses that see an opportunity and uh, so they want to um, you know develop expertise uh, in that area um, what you'll find with Chinese uh, generally Chinese people they do keep their cards very close to their chest um, Australians are a lot more open book um, you know, we, uh, I think to our detriment at times, um, we do give too much information away and uh, uh, Chinese are masters at holding information and, um, and extracting information out of the person that they're dealing with. So um, just be very uh, wary about that um, without um, closing yourself up too much. Um, uh, the other thing, there are many uh, Chinese uh, business people who uh, may set up a wine business um, uh, primarily around migrating to Australia and there's, there's been lots of instances of that, you know, import-export businesses. So just be wary that, uh, you know, if you're going to sell to someone on that basis, is it sustainable or is it a one-off sale? Um, and certainly what I've seen, I've met um, many new people around um, the wine business, um, they do lack knowledge. So they've they might have come from the rice wine industry and they've been distributing rice wine or beer or whatever and uh, so wines, um, it is unfamiliar to them and the team of people that they've got working in their business, wine is relatively um, unfamiliar. So you know, they might have sales people but they don't have an expertise in wine so, so that's where you're going to have to get involved in ed education. Um, and certainly, um, you know, being prepared to travel, I, I talked about that before, but, you know, getting on the ground and meeting, meeting those customers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jing's uh, touched on Chinese culture and um, an understanding of Chinese culture is, I think it's fundamental um, if you want to be successful in the market. Um, uh, it is a culture like no other. Um, it has a very deep history and, um, and it's quite complicated. So. Um, I certainly don't know everything about Chinese culture, but um, uh, by spending time there, you, 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 you pick things up over time and you talk to other people. Um, Chinese people feel very comfortable about doing business over a cup of tea uh, or uh, over, the, over the dinner table. And that, has just, that is entrenched within their culture. Um, so um, just be prepared that you will have meetings um, uh, dr drinking multiple cups of tea in one sitting. Uh, fortunately, they're not really big cups, they're small cups. Um, and, um, but it's a, it is a more disarming way of doing business. And then um, certainly over the dinner table is um, very common um, at all levels uh, uh, you know, of business and society through China. Um, trust is absolutely uh, critical, I think, to, to long-term business success. 
um, and trust doesn't happen overnight. Um, you need to meet, um, uh, have, have multiple meetings with your customer in, in those types of settings, in multiple settings, um, to build that trust. Um, and uh, there's a thing called Guangxi, which um, you know is really about it's it's our Australian term for, for networking, mm -hmm. and um, you know um, in in China uh, the 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 networks are very complex and they they're very very wide, far reaching. So um, if you build trust with a particular individual and they have confidence in you, then they will start to refer you to their um, network of contacts, mm -hmm. and so that can lead to other business. Um, opportunities for you. Um, um, it's not society, you know, not very um, uh, responsible to say be prepared to drink wine and get drunk with your customer, but um, uh, the reality is um, that's what happens in China um, in the majority of instances, and um, it is about face. It's about um, you know uh, the toasting culture is very very um, prevalent. In, in their society and, ar and around the table. And um, you need to learn how to toast and, and how to respond to people when they toast to you. And, and quite often um, in that toasting uh, process, um, you don't just sip the wine, uh, you, you bottoms up. And um, you know, so as a consequence, uh, you know, things, people get carried away and they get excited and before you know it, uh, you know, there's a fair bit of wine has been consumed. And is that Expected that sort of um, look. It is from a face point of view. Yeah. Um, you know that uh, if if the person who toasts you um, chooses to empty the glass, um, then um, it is polite for you to uh, to respond. Um, so uh, you know you will get challenged. I guarantee if you're doing business for the first time, they will challenge you around that, and uh, you have to be very smart about it. Make sure you've got a couple of people around you who can protect you and support you. Um, uh, so you really do, and where that comes from is the fact that uh, people have been doing that for thousands of years, you know, or hundreds of years, um, in drinking rice, wine and beer. And in the majority of uh, Chinese restaurants in China, you will see people drinking beer and rice wine, and, um, and that will be consumed at a fairly rapid rate in a lot of instances. Um, uh, so another critical thing is to understand that China is not one country uh, you know, there are 32 different provinces and, um, you know, people speak differently in different parts of the country and um, there's, uh, every, every province has its own unique culture and the people um, have a different dialect and, and, and eat different types of food and they're very parochial about um, their own uh, province and, and even their own city. So um, you need to take uh, that into consideration when you move around the country and where your customer base might be. Um, I, I think in terms of this step, in, in terms of exclusivity, I would um, say be very, very careful. I wouldn't give exclusivity to one customer in China because of the fact that it's such a vast country and um, you've got um, essentially 32 different markets. Um, and um, there are, I mean, I don't even know whether the largest importer, ASC, covers the entire market. It's, it's probably unlikely that they do. Mm -hmm. um, so if they can't do it, um, uh, then you know, don't, certainly don't expect to, to take over the whole of the market. Um, and uh, you know, I started doing business in China with multiple um, import partners and, um, and, and I think that's a, uh, that's a, that's a good way to to do business because they will concentrate on certain parts of the market geographically and they'll do those um, hopefully quite well because of the relationships and contacts they've got in that part of the market. Um, uh, and yeah, so I, I'd only, you know, if you're, you're a smaller producer and you have limited capacity, um, then um, I would only concentrate on one or two provinces. The other thing is about money, so uh, be very, very careful. I wouldn't give credit to um, any new customer that you're doing business with, and I would still not necessarily give credit to um, uh, that customer after the second or third transaction. Um, so um, you'd, you'd have to get to a point where you know that customer very well, um, and they've got good trading history, you've spent enough time with them on the ground before you start uh, giving 
uh, giving credit to them. Okay, so um, my, my last point around um, travel, and I, and I want to focus on education, um, because think about China, uh, don't think about China as Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, but think about it as uh, a little bit like the wild west of wine. Okay, so um, you know these tier two, tier four, tier two to tier four cities. Um, uh, most, as I said, you walk into most restaurants and you don't see bottles of wine everywhere. You might see some wine behind the counter, but um, people are, are, have been drinking rice wine, they're drinking beer, and they're starting to try wine, but they don't know a lot about it. So, um, so you need to spend time with your customer um, or with your imported distributor. Um, you need to demonstrate your commitment to them um, and, and then part of that commitment is educating. It's not only educating them, it's educating their sales people it's, and then it's educating, helping to educate their customers as well. To what level of education can you expect to sort of start at? Um, uh, start by uh, what's the difference between Shiraz and okay. Cabernet and Merlot? Um, what's the difference between Australia and France? And, um, uh, and the old world versus the new world. Uh, yeah, what's, uh, why does our wine taste uh, fruitier than uh, you know, French wine? Um, so it's as basic as that. it's talking about tannin, it's talking about sugar. Um, you know, so uh, it's, it's, it's very much at the, at the ground level. Mm -hmm. And it's even uh, showing people you know, how to actually drink wine rather than uh, you know, the, 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 the gambay. So the whole idea of uh, you know, sniff and swirl. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important that you do that in front of the customer so that they can see um, how you're doing it and take their cues from you. Um, uh, so when we talk about wine culture, there is a wine culture that is strong in parts of China, but it's certainly not strong in a significant part of China. Uh, so um, I when I talk about, ba uh, say, back to basics, it is back to basics, it's exactly what I just talked about. And um, uh, so if you're in the wine industry, we all have the skills to be able to do that. Um, so just be prepared and, um, uh, you know, work out your own um, style and presentation and, 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 uh, and be prepared to start at that level um, uh, for some customers, but be also be prepared to talk at a different level for other level. customers. Yep. Um, yeah, and uh, look, we can get precious about watching uh, people scull our wine, and we put a lot. We all put a lot of effort, and we all have a lot of passion in in what we do. Um, it is a bit um, hard to take sometimes when you see uh, people not appreciating the, your product in the way that you would like to see it appreciated. Um, but uh, your task is to educate them. Um, if you push too hard and you hold your ground and say, you know, that's absolutely inappropriate, it's unacceptable, um, it's, it could backfire on you because, um, you know, that may affect that, uh, the customer's uh, thinking um, and you may actually embarrass them in front of the people that they have around the table if you go, uh, go down that path. So um, it's basically coming along with them for the ride and then um, educating them uh, together. So. Um, and I think finally, uh, one of the things that I've found most powerful is to bring the customer and maybe some of their customers to, the, uh, to your winery. If you can get them to travel to Australia, um, you, uh, they can see your winery firsthand, they can see how you operate, um, and they develop a greater understanding of all the processes that um, go into making wine, uh, you know, the viticulture and uh, etc. And, um, uh, and so they, um, they will leave not only with a greater understanding, they'll be able to feel more confident that they can go out and sell your product um, and uh, they'll have a greater attachment um, sure. to your brand. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that'd be you know, certainly one of uh, the key points that I'd like to finish with. Okay. We have a question here for you. Um, what's the worst mistake that you've seen a wine brand or winemaker make in China? Um, <laughs> not mentioning not sure about mistakes, but I, I have seen the, the number of um, fake, when I say fake, um, 
wine brands that um, have no authenticity. So um, I've seen a, um, a lot of uh, labels out there that are probably not even produced by any Australian company, but um, uh, they are produced um, specifically for China. Um, so, um, and over time, um, those, uh, I don't believe those products will be sustainable. So um, people will buy those because they don't know about them, um, but over time they will get found out. And if uh, the, the less authentic um, you see out there, then uh, the less sustainable they'll be, mm -hmm. and uh, and I've seen it with, uh, you know, with our 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 um, uh, one of our distribution partners has asked us to develop products specifically for the market, and um, and I haven't seen as great a uh, uptake of some of those products as a consequence of them not being an international product, or not being sold internationally in other markets, so um, you know. People in China take their cues from mm -hmm. uh, global brands and the fact that they're sold in the UK or the US or Australia or whatever. So, um, you know, it is more, asp you know, wine is an aspirational product and um, they'd like to think that if they're drinking something in China, then they're also, uh, people are drinking it in Australia. Okay, so there's not necessarily going to be the expectation that a distributor is going to ask you to, to um, produce a, a, a unique label for them. Or indeed, is, uh, yeah, you know, a, yes. change, change the name perhaps. Um, the there, 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 there will be, but as long as it's from uh, you as a recognised, you know, wine company, and it could be another product in, in your range. Um, okay. So, um, uh, but yeah, or you know, if we talk about online, you know, there's uh, uh, online uh, companies that are asking uh, producers to produce uh, products specifically for that online okay. uh, platform so that they don't have to compete on price with other online uh, retailers out there. Alright. Uh, wow, this one's an interesting one. <clears throat> um, with the benefit of hindsight, Andrew, have your efforts in China been sufficiently worthwhile for your business? Uh, oh look, it's definitely been worthwhile. Uh, I mean our business is fundamentally very different to what it was um, uh, three or four years ago, so you know we're a bigger business, and um, you know we've got a broader distribution footprint, not only in Australia but um, China. So, um, but we haven't conquered China yet. You know, we've I know a lot more about China, um, uh, but uh, you know we've still got a long way to go. So, um, uh, it's been frustrating, and um, you know, but it's been rewarding at the same time. But um, uh, yeah, I, you know, um, yeah. So it's a, look, it's a, China's a journey that you go on. If you want to, if you want to um, have a go at China, expect that you're going to you're going to go on a journey, and you'll have your, your, your have your ups and downs, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you um, you just need to be committed. Mm -hmm. And if you're committed to it and you approach it in the right way, um, ultimately you'll be successful. But you won't be successful overnight. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a long it's a long term play. It's mm -hmm. not a short-term play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you need to be prepared to hang in for the long haul. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Jing, Aaron and Steve to, to rejoin us for our Q&A session. Um, so I'll briefly put our... We'll be putting a slide up to um, just give us a chance to get everyone back in shot and me out of shot. Um, to, to uh, squeeze us all in here. So be sure to uh, get your questions ready if you've got any more and um, we'll be look forward to being able to answer them.
joining us for our Q&A session. Um, now, let me get the ball rolling. Um, the austerity measures and the uh, economic slowdown in China, what effect has that had on uh, wine sales to date? Well, look, I think um, the information that we have is that it affected the whole wine category, um, not just Australia. So Australia went back uh, commensurate with the, uh, with the whole category. Um, the talk is that these austerity measures will remain for at least for another two years and have an impact. I think from the data that we're seeing, we are Australia as a category is back in growth. Um, so I think th there's still some residual hangover there. Um, but um, I think the, the good thing is that uh, Australia has established a, a platform in the marketplace where it's not just about gift giving or give, about giving those uh, you know, at that official level. It, it's got uh, kudos around being in the on-trade, being in the off-trade. Any other Any thoughts? Other? The government officials are running scared. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I've seen it firsthand. Um, and uh, look, it was a false economy anyway. So, uh, you know, as marketers, uh, we need to be focusing on our on the consumers and uh, and the trade. And uh, you know they were it, it just it wasn't a sustainable market. Um, so you know it'll it, time will tell. But um, what I've found with Chinese people is that they're very good at finding a way around things. So you know it's very tough at the moment, very tight, and they've they've really clamped up. But um, over time, uh, it'll trickle back into that sector, but not at, not to the same extent that it was previously. Anything else to add on that topic? Yes, well, the Chinese government is trying to encourage people to think about a thing called the new normal. Okay, the new normal, which is basically um, getting rid of the, some of the uh, shunky and dodgy practices in business, and as Andrew said, uh, you know, some of the corrupt uh, government officials, which in the, in the long run is really good for the for the country. So, um, but in the short run, I mean, it's not really that bad. If you, I mean, people talk about the economic slowdown, uh, but the reality is that it's still it's, it's still growing at 7.4 which translates into, uh, I think it's over $673 billion into China's economy last year, which is actually bigger than the year before, uh, in, in 2013, which was about 7.9%. So it's, the economy is still growing at a rapid speed uh, that you don't see in most other nations. And the, uh, the disposable income level and all the, uh, uh, the key uh, index figures, they're all going up. It's not, not as dramatically as before. So. Um, uh, things don't happen like crazy um, like 10 years ago, but you still see a steady and more sustainable growth. So in the long run, I think very positive in terms of the, uh, the exporting of wine. Just to back up that point, I, I read recently that about that uh, growth rate. It's the lowest in uh, 24 years, I think, of 7.4%. But it's actually welcome. It's getting some normality and some reality back into a market that was incredibly overheated. So, uh, you know, it's, it is a low number, well, lowish in Chinese terms, but it's what it means is a, a bit more surety around the direction of the economy there. Has, has either of those things, the economic downturn or the um, uh, austerity measures, had any impact on, on prices? Has it put any sort of downward pressure on them at all? I haven't seen it yet. Okay. I think um, it's just such a fragmented market uh, that, you know, we don't have the dominance of, uh, you know, retailers like we do here. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 I'd call it fragmented and chaotic. So <laughs> you just not, I don't think you'll see that. At, at this point in time, I think from again from an Australian wine perspective, our dollars per litre reflect that uh, we're sitting at premium price points, and we haven't seen a, a decline in those price points. So, if anything, Australia is holding ground, even with these austerity measures in place. And the other point that hasn't been mentioned yet, of course, is with the declining Australian dollar uh, against uh, the renminbi as, as much as against the American dollar and others. That can only be beneficial as well in, uh, in the coming months. Uh, now, many SME wineries can't meet the volumes or price points expected of, of many Chinese importers where often a minimum order is a, is a you know, cargo load. Um, is the Chinese market therefore a sustainable one for that size of producer? And on top of that, are there therefore opportunities to tap into niche markets that may be willing to accept you know, smaller volumes at higher prices? 
Look, I think when we look at the uh, the number of Australian winery, wineries that are exporting to China, it's over 900, and I, I'm pretty well guaranteed that there's all shapes and forms from small to medium to large that that are exporting. So, and I think Andrew, you you alluded to it, is that don't don't bite off and try and do the whole market because even the big boys can't do that. The ASCs or Torres of the world, it's it's targeting a city or two. It's it's finding a, a distributor that suits your needs. It's understanding your own strategic priority for that market and where you fit. So th there's plenty of opportunity there. It's about finding your niche and and looking at that and sticking to that that path. So um, yeah, look, I think um, th there's there's ample opportunity there. Um, I just quickly add a few other interesting things, and I think in this challenging time, it's really important to think creatively and sometimes outside of the square. Um, last year, Austrade ran a campaign on a website called Tmall, which is the largest business-to-consumer website in China, and they had this idea of Australia Week, so they spent uh, five days promoting Australian products on this website. It was hugely popular in China, and they had all sorts of different products like, you know, baby formula, Ugg boots, or skincare products, uh, even Weebix, you know, 1.3 kilo box Weebix that was, uh, I think, in, in Australia, is available for uh, uh, just over $4. In China, it's sold for more than $10. And some of the wine uh, brands are available on, um, on that website for a week. So there are things that I think as an industry that can um, they can do together and so certainly uh, thinking collaboratively with some of the other industries as well. Yeah. Is online an opportunity for, for an SME? Um, and if it is, who are the major um, distributors in that regard? Um, I, I think so. I mean, last year, um, one of the most amazing statistics out of China last year is that uh, the retail, online retail sector grew a whopping 47%. I mean, 47% growth in 2014, that's extraordinary. I mean, and it is widely predicted that uh, by 2020, um, the online retail sector in China will be larger than the combined markets of US, um, UK, France, Germany, and Japan all put together. So I think definitely there's something that wineries can start thinking about, but it doesn't mean it's, it's gonna be a quick fix. I think, you know, small to medium wineries, it's unlikely you're gonna go direct to an online retailer. You're gonna go through uh, an importer or distributor. So uh, there's definitely a route to that market um, uh, or to that segment of the market, but um, it, it's unlikely to be a direct route unless you're a larger player. One, one of the things maybe as well is, um, and we, we haven't spoken about it today, is, is Hong Kong as a, a bit of an entry point for China as well. Hong Kong's now the fifth largest market for Australian wine. It sits at $110 million. It's the highest value per litre of any of our export countries, uh, wine uh, going to export countries. So maybe there's some opportunities there to uh, start sowing the brand into Hong Kong and, and getting that influx into, into the southern uh, areas as well. So look, I, I think, uh, we can treat uh, Hong Kong as a separate entity or we can actually include it into the mix of China as well. Uh, how much marketing leverage does a wine show medal from a local Chinese uh, event offer? And therefore, depending on your answer, should SMEs be encouraged to enter into more of them, more of those sorts of events? What, what I'll do is just talk to the, some of the consumer research around uh, uh, the, the Chinese, when they're looking for cues to buy wine, they, they actually look for s those uh, those accolades on, on bottles, whether it's scores of out of 100 or, or gold medals. Interestingly, the two least favoured uh, sort of reference points for buying wine is staff in store and uh, and, and, and a sommelier in a, in a, uh, in a restaurant, so which I, I found quite interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'd say that awards, accolades, anything like that adds kudos, adds uh, impetus. But uh, again, I'll defer to the fellows on the ground. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, you're better off having a, a, a gold medal than, than no medal. Uh, the more international and more respected your show is that you're entering into, or, uh, then that's going to carry a, a little bit more uh, more weight as well. So um, price is also a significant cue for people in China. Uh, and I talked about face. And, uh, you know, so some people won't buy a wine unless it's over, you know, 250 or 300 RMB, because if they're giving it to someone or they're taking it somewhere, it's all about, um, you know, how they look in, in, in that person's eyes. Uh, we have another question here from Andrew Kayard, uh, who asks, can you explain briefly the distribution channels in China? Um, what are the on-trade and off-trade opportunities there? Can you talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> One on the ground. Um, okay, distribution channels. 
So, uh, well, look, on, on trade, obviously we've got, uh, you know, uh, five star, four star hotels. Um, uh, and, um, you know, they are, I suppose, signature, um, uh, signat that's a signature channel. Um, you know, if you can get your products into those uh, five-star hotels, then, uh, you know, people take cues from it or you actually use the fact that, you know, you're in those hotels uh, to sell your product to, you know, through, uh, through other channels. Um, uh, I talked about the restaurant channel and, and obviously Western restaurants, uh, you know, have a, uh, there, there's a great opportunity there. Um, and there is, you know, there's growth of Western restaurants, but um, mainly in those tier one and, and tier two cities. So you're not seeing much in the tier three and tier four cities. Um, uh, but Chinese restaurants, um, you see a lot less, uh, you know, wine uh, consumed in the traditional Chinese restaurants. Um, and then, uh, you look, the retail s sector, I think, is, is very, um, very fragmented. Um, you've got the supermarket channels, you've got the big players, you've got Walmart, um, uh, Tesco, you've got Vanguard, um, uh, uh, Metro, um, you know, so supermarket is a big channel, but um, what, what, what I've seen is, is the consumption uh, through supermarket is not as big as uh, what you think it is. So um, it's, it's quite often just about um, having representation in those um, retail in the supermarket channel um, and that your product is accessible but you're not necessarily seeing the uh, you know the volume that you would see through a Tesco in the UK or um, uh, you know um, in the US through Whole Foods or one of those chains so um, uh, and then you know there's a proliferation of um, different types of retail stores. Uh, you know, you've got dedicated wine stores opening up now. They're not on a large format scale like, uh, you know, with Dan Murphy's or First Choice. Um, so they're smaller uh, stores and then you've got, um, you know, uh, multiple liquor stores. So they sell rice wine, they sell cigarettes and they sell, you know, starting to introduce wine. So, um, but there's no, you know, I'm interested to what you, what you think, but in terms of dominance, you know, there's not one dominant um, retailer out there uh, like we have in Australia. Um, and uh, so I talked about it being fragmented and a, and a little bit chaotic. And, and I think it's going to be that way um, for a while to, to come. But over time, there'll be some consolidation. Oh, no, look, I think uh, uh, support what Andrew's spoken about and I think also we have that, that online factor which is uh, again in what was it 47 percent growth uh, last year coming into play stronger and stronger all the time and when you talk about the likes of yes my wine have got six and a half million active customers and uh, uh, you know they're, they're serious players in the marketplace you know the hyper markets are out there the supermarkets are out there there's decent representation but as Andrew alluded to there's more and more of the specialist wine stores coming into play and, and more tailored offerings. I might just quickly add, um, numerous research have indicated that uh, the, one of the biggest concerns for Chinese consumers when they choose a wine is they don't actually know whether the wine they're buying is a genuine product or just a counterfeit product. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that uh, a lot of Chinese don't trust uh, the people in the shops. Uh, you know, this, they would assume that the, the people in the shops are just trying to sell the, the most expensive ones. And I think certainly, uh, as Andrew also said, that sometimes you put those wines in the hotels and in places, not just because you can sell them, but sometimes it's just to build a brand presence, to tell people I'm here, okay, I'm a global brand, and certainly online, because most of these online websites will actually have a guarantee that the, the, all the products on those websites are genuine products, so it will take away some of the fear, fear factors amongst the Chinese consumers. Yeah. Andrew, I've got a question for you, still on the topic of, of distributors. Um, Angelina de Holst asks, uh, she's not in China, but she's definitely thinking about it, how does she go about finding a distributor, or should she try the online space, which we've touched on? Uh, look, where do you start with distributors? You can start with uh, attending a, a, um, one or two trade shows. Um, pick very carefully, do your research on, uh, you know, they have, there's, there's lots of trade shows going on in China. Um, uh, but yeah, do your research on, on which one you think is, is worth having a crack at. If you can be under the guise of Wine Australia or whatever, then that's going to give you a bit more support and strength and attract more people. 
uh, you know, to that particular, uh, you know, uh, to your winery. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, look, on um, Austrade is, you know, uh, can facilitate um, access to the market. Um, they, they've, uh, we've participated in some road shows that they put on uh, that were, you know, in some uh, new cities. Uh, that was, uh, and they certainly attracted people, uh, you know, to, to those events. Um, so that, um, if you want to find a uh, distributor in a, you know, particular province or whatever, then that's a good opportunity if you can tap into something like um, that, if they're going to put another one of those on. Um, and then online, um, look, I think it's going to be hard for you to access uh, the market, uh, the online retailer directly. Um, I mean, you can reach out, you can gather your info on all the, uh, the online retailers, but to to, um, to to go direct at the moment, I think, is going to be challenging for a, for a small winery. Um, so then it's a matter of finding a distributor that you know has a contact and supply already supplies existing online retailers. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier, Andrew, about entry-level pricing. What FOB price are you actually talking about when you uh, say Oh, look, you're talking anywhere from uh, 30... 30 to uh, 40 uh, FOB Australian dollars. Uh, so, you know, and that, that'll end up anywhere on the shelf from, you know, uh, 70 to 80 uh, RMB to, you know, 100, 130 RMB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Judy asks, how can you check the validity of a company in China wanting to buy your wine? How do you make sure they're kosher? <laughs> do you want to answer that? <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that exact question, but I'd just like to pick up on uh, something that Jing said earlier about um, protecting your brand. Again, I think it's related to that question and, uh, and also the, the issue of counterfeiting. Uh, I think before you even start to think about selling a product for the first time in China, you need to be absolutely sure you've had your trademark registered. Uh, and... It, it's, it's easier than it sounds because you don't have to go to China to do it. Uh, you can do it uh, through the Australian Trademark Office. It's not automatic. You have to ask that office, now known as IP Australia, you have to ask them to uh, invoke something called the Madrid Protocol. Madrid as in the Spanish city. And uh, so it's not an automatic exercise, but you can have your brand protected in China through that mechanism. You don't have to go there and employ Chinese lawyers and, and to do it for you. Uh, so it's sort of, it's sort of related to, to that question. Um, but, you know, we absolutely recommend that, uh, that you do that before you even start to think about doing business in China. I think um, when it comes to checking credentials on the ground, uh, spending a little bit of time with an Austrade office isn't a bad thing. It's it's a little bit of an investment, but what you know they have the the legs on the ground. They have the resource to investigate, and they you know, and generally, you know, we work quite closely with Austrade offices around the world, and and they're they're very uh, capable and they're very good at uh, digging deep and finding answers for you. And I mean, look, I I talked about getting over there and meeting the customer going to their facility you know their premises um, you know physically having a, a, a good look at, at, at how they operate um, just be very careful I talked about China and face um, just about every distributor I've met drives a BMW or an Audi or uh, some sort of car like that now they might not pay cash for that you know it's all about it is about face and and do not take that as as a representation that your customer is a, is as a wealthy business person um, so you know you, you you do have to spend time there and have a good look I'm going to just quickly add, um, I think it's, this is time you really need to invest your time in building your uh, connections with the, uh, the Chinese business community. Because we believe as Chinese that we don't do business with strangers, we do business with friends. And that's when, I mean, Andrew said earlier about the concept of relationship. And if, if the relationship goes through some of the familiar uh, personnel, it's, you're more likely to get a, a, a success, all of those relationships, rather than just, you know, uh, somebody cold calling you. And I think it's uh, for smaller exporters, you, you, you may want to you know, uh, start thinking about what sort of business connections you can actually build on the ground here in Australia before you jump on a plane and go to China and you know, hope for the best.
that's unfortunately all we've got time for today. So thanks to everyone uh, watching for joining us. Um, I hope you all gained a greater insight into the, into the Chinese market. Uh, just a reminder that everyone who's registered for today's webcast will receive a copy of the audio visual and the slides that have been used. Uh, a link to view the webcast again and to download the slides will be provided in the next day or so. A uh, big thank you to the National Wine Centre for hosting our webcast today. Thank you to AGWA and WCA for organising today's webcast. Uh, they look forward to joining uh, them, you joining them for more webcasts in the future. And finally, if uh, you're able to uh, take advantage of the exit survey um, and let us know, give us your feedback on, uh, on how today went and how we might improve uh, future webcasts, we'd certainly love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. And good afternoon.